because I feel like I started hearing the term a long time ago, but it was, it's never kind of quite clear. Yeah, like when was the exact year? I, I don't know, 2008? Yeah, something, something like, like that. 2009? I remember being with an Oscon and like Chef, like being one of those companies that was like out there and, yeah. and the, 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 like the word kind of coming up. There were sort of two like seminal things, right? So Patrick Dubois, who's a dude in, in Belgium, mm-hmm. like wrote, uh, wrote a blog post about what he was seeing uh, in terms of the, this rise in cooperation between developers mm-hmm. and operations people. And then John Allspot and Paul Hammond gave a talk at Velocity mm-hmm. um, that was called like 10 deploys a day at Flickr, a dev mm-hmm. and ops yeah. cooperation story or whatever. And like those two things together, I think really are what got you to the word, like mm-hmm. to calling it DevOps. And I think it was Patrick who first said like, first like put the portmanteau together, you know, and sort of made that what it was. Yeah. And that was, that feels like it was roughly 2009. I, what's interesting about it is that I think you, um, you have the, you have lots of different people in, like they didn't know each other, Patrick and mm-hmm. John, um, and certainly the guys at Google who had been developing the SRE program, like they didn't know them either, you know? Um, and there's this, it was just so, sort of happened uh, organically because it was the same challenge everybody was facing everywhere and had done multiple times in their career. Right, and it's interesting because I remember around the same time there was also like the NoSQL term and the NoSQL wave, yeah. and it was similarly kind of ambiguous, right? Like, what does that yeah. even mean, and, and is that the right term? And I remember back in those days thinking DevOps was like such a bad name. I think it was. It, it's a terrible name. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's an awful name. But you know what was good about it, though, I think, is it kind of really captured the essence of of you know, develop, developers and operations and, and kind of how they were getting yeah. closer together. And it wasn't very descriptive as to what the technology underneath it would be, but it turns out, you know, the technology underneath it did change quite a bit yeah. since the term appeared, right? I think the term's fine as, as a thing that describes, like, the cooperation that we require. You know, what sucks is that, like, what if, you, what if you, you're like a security guy mm-hmm. and you're like, well, I'm not a developer or operations. Right. So now do we as a DevSecOps now because we have to collaborate too. Mm-hmm. And so like it kind of, it, that was weird. Mm-hmm. I don't know what a better word would have been yeah. that, that would have been you know, more helpful. I think the fact that it's fundamentally a cultural thing first. Mm-hmm. So there is a tooling change right. and that's really dramatic, but that tooling change is in support of the cultural mm-hmm. transition, right? right? So there's this culture you have to change. If you have tooling already in, what company doesn't sort of have tooling that supports their workflow, mm-hmm. right? And if you want to change the way people work, you have to change the tools. Right. And so that, they, they go together. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I don't, I don't know how descriptive it is of, in terms of like a generation of tooling, but in a way it's descriptive enough because you can sort of put anything that, that, <clears throat> that encourages that collaboration um, and helps bring those people together right. into a single workflow, right. into a single set of behavior. Right. Like those are sort of DevOps tools. Right. And I'm very, very kind of uh, intrigued by that because, of course, like a lot of stuff happened, like, you know, cloud happened and, and a lot of different things that you, you could say are like their own distinct kind of machines and, yeah. and waves. But it does seem like DevOps as a cultural thing has had like a really far reaching impact. And, and I would link it personally, and maybe you disagree, with even stuff today like microservices or, or function right. as a service. Like this idea of like this line between writing code and running code um, and yeah. all the people that have to do a mix of that, uh, how much that has changed you know, if you look at a startup, or even if you look at a big company yeah. you know, in 2008 versus dramatically. today, right? I think it's more interesting to look at big companies than startups because right. like, you know, startups are small and like, you can always be wacky. Right. Like, you, know, you find a venture investor who's willing to let you be a little nutty if the returns are good and like, who is not. Right. You know, like uh, revenue covers a lot of sins there in, mm-hmm. in venture sure. land. So like, uh, but like when you look at large companies, like, yeah, you absolutely see these really dramatic changes in, uh, you know, you look at companies like Alaska Airlines, mm-hmm. which talks about being like the 60 second airline, you right. know, where everything that you, that a customer goes through needs to complete in 60 seconds. Right. And if you ask them what's, what's integral to making that happen, they'll tell you DevOps is one of those most integral things. Absolutely. Like we can't do it without this like super high degree of collaboration and coordination and software and operations. And like, it's really fundamental to what they're doing. And right. you know, you're seeing the same thing at, <clears throat> at Nike and at giant banks. And you know, it's super. It's it super works really on two levels, right? It changed the internal like engineering culture now that you have in companies, but it also really facilitated, in my opinion, like this transition where now a lot of, um, you know, industries that weren't about 
technology in a strict sense, or that kind of technology, it's not yeah, about yeah. software, become increasingly relevant software. And you said airlines, that's a big example, right? You know, the, uh, wasn't it right. Delta or some other airline that had like, this gigantic screw up, right? Yes. Was their, their automation and everything else. And that can really kind of nail your business now. And it's not just the Amazon and the, the pure software no, it's, coming to this it's, world. it's every single organization, right? right? <clears throat> in a way that I think is really, like, is super different. Right. And, you know, when you look at DevOps coming out of the, that, what the, the people who really strongly felt it first, we were all web innovators. Right. And the one thing that's true about all of the web innovators is that they are exclusively software companies. Right. Our businesses only right. exist as software. Like, uh, and, and what's becoming increasingly true is everybody's business basically only exists as right. software. Yeah. Um, you know, especially you, know, you look at something like, uh, like consumer banking. Um, if you, if your consumer bank has a poor online web portal, right. uh, and you can't do online banking, uh, you will switch banks right. because you don't want to go to the bank. Yeah. You, you like you'll they're literally using it as a competitive weapon. It's a bit of a chicken and egg thing, right? To some extent, DevOps help kind of companies make that transition, but there's also this you know incredible market demand to kind of go towards like faster iteration of software, even if you're an airline, even if yeah. you're a bank. I would argue that the that the macro trend, the market pulled us, we didn't push it. Okay. Um, that that the market was pulling those companies in that direction. Mm -hmm. And then when you look when you stand up and look around, you know, if you work in a mutual mm -hmm. company, you work at a bank, you work at whatever, and you and you're trying to figure out, well what should we do? You know, it's natural to look for prior art. You're know, like, right. well who's good at this? Like who who goes faster? Who who can what is competitive in this way? And what you find when you do that is big web companies, right? right? Um, and so it's sort of natural that that happens. What, what's interesting there is that, you know, there's sort of two I think there's 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 an argument that's happening in the industry right now that I don't I don't think is particularly true, which is that that therefore what's going to happen is that all those big companies will wind up looking like Google or they'll look like Facebook or they'll look like whatever. And I think that that is, uh, I think it's wrong, um, it, partly because it, it, it sells short uh, the difficulties inherent in running those industries. Like it's not the same to run Morgan Stanley as it is to run Google, it's just not. And that doesn't mean that you won't have very similar uh, principles, very similar beliefs, very similar technology maybe even, but uh, will the technology solutions be identical right. to Google? Will they rebuild? You know, how long will it take before we rebuild something like SAP core banking right. um, uh, on in the same way Google built it? Is right. there even value in right. building it that way? Like, does it ever get big enough that you care? Mm -hmm. um, and we're not asking those questions yet, right? right. Um, we're still asking just the first question, which is, holy crap! Like, right. how do I go fast enough to be competitive? Right. We're not actually asking the question of. How am I going to build that technology in a way that suits right. the business or, or is good for everybody? It's true, and that's a big opportunity, I think, for 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 uh, entrepreneurs because there's kind of something on there's kind of two tracks happening. It happens quite a bit, but in DevOps, it's particularly visible where you kind of have the Google, Facebook, you know, startup-led type of uh, yeah. open source projects, and then you have like. Um, enterprise players, enterprise startups, that are like able yeah. to factor either those stacks or those concepts and and sell them, you know, to to the this kind of more yeah. stodgy, you to know, established player. audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you see a lot of companies like that. You know, for every kind of big Kubernetes project or something like that that catches up in the open open source, you can usually find five to ten enterprise startups that are doing very very well. You know, kind of selling a variant of that to to kind of the enterprise. And, and I yeah. think that's always something to to remember if you're doing a startup. It's not necessarily about the pure play, cool open source software stuff. You could be doing, although that certainly can be and, and is so, successful. Yeah. Uh, but there's also kind of different ways to think about the problem, and matching it to the audience is usually a big problem. Yeah, I think for in terms of entrepreneurial opportunity and venture opportunity, like I think there's an incredible opportunity to really think differently about how we design a product to the needs of those organizations, mm -hmm. and. In the same way that you know, when you look at the one thing that's true of Google and Facebook and Yahoo and all those companies, even though they have dramatically different <coughs> cultures and they have very different technology stacks, one thing that's true, they all maniacally focused on their own workflow, on their right. own needs. They, they, they built it, it was, right. it's the way Google works now. Yeah. And, and asking the question, well, okay, how will these enterprises work now? Like asking that question requires you to actually understand how they work, and and when you look at how developers talk and how, especially in the big web, like you know, we tend to talk about those companies as like legacy. We talk about the software they run as legacy. And what we mean by that is all the software that runs all the things in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So the entire world economy runs on legacy software, right. and we talk about it as if it's like this rotting pile of garbage, <laughs> and it's just fascinating because like. Okay, maybe some of it is, but like, really? Like, it's all just like they're all just 
like the worst, dumbest yeah. people who have ever existed on the planet. Yeah. It's a very poor product position to start out from, saying, right. hey, if only all these people could stop being stupid, like they've right. been for however long they've right. been, then, then, and just do this thing that's completely different, then everything would be cool. Right. And like, that's, that's a very, it's, I mean, maybe that's the only way, right. and maybe they are, yeah. but it feels really unlikely. Yeah, it is such a big thing, right, to, to think about, you know, not necessarily solving a technical challenge, but solving that, that, that business fit, right, of yeah. like, how do you get people who are in the situation, who have this kind of stack, who have those business concerns, and get them to adopt this? And I think, you know, if you look at software in general, you can find a lot of companies um, you know, like Twilio, for example, or, or you know, or PubNub, or or even Amazon, right? Where a lot of the innovation there weren't so much technical; they were about like the, the business way. They so were about delivery. It was right. about it was about the user experience. Instead of buying about, servers, you can rent them. Yeah. Instead of like you know right. uh, hiring a, a consultant to do this, you can just buy this. And there as was an API. definitely technical innovation back there, right? Mm -hmm. But like, but that's not what that's not what really made it. Right. And like, I think that's like especially EC2, like renting a server is an interesting one. So like. You know, our first pass at trying to do that for large enterprises was was like OpenStack. It was right. it was the private cloud, right? right? And like, those have largely failed. Mm -hmm. Like, if we if we really go look at like how many of those deployments are really successful and how many people are really happy with it, like it's not not nearly as much as you had hoped. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that that was going to become this pervasive primitive mm -hmm. for on-premise gear inside these huge enterprises. To looks right now like that's not going to be true. Right, and, and so yeah. what's the right design? Right. Because it clearly isn't just copying what AWS did because it's not quite the same, right? right? And so what is the behavior that you want? Uh, and what is the interface that those right. people want? And we don't know, and that's where you've got, that's where the real oppor like entrepreneurial right. opportunity lives, right? Yeah, and conversely, you have the other way around, right? where we're, you know, uh, largely like developers sort of moved on from past in, in a large sense, you know, and, and the, the Roku kind of way of doing it. But now that's extremely popular in the enterprise, and that's really kind of having a second you can, life. You can see the lag, right? right? And like, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a vocal PaaS doubter, right? right? Like, I think in general, um, I, I tend to believe more in human beings mm -hmm. and the way and like what they feel and think. And like a good example there is like people just they don't like to be put in a box and they definitely don't stay there once you put them in. And so like uh, I'm buying a house and it's a it's a beautiful house. and I'm really excited about it. Um, but what it isn't is a manufactured home. And like you could go buy a plot of land and stick a manufacturing home on it, and the catalogs are huge, and they have every possible feature you could ever want in a home. And they'll just snap it together; it'll be done in like a right. month, and it'll be amazing. Yeah. But no one will do it. Like yeah. you don't do it, yeah. and you don't do it because yeah. you want to. You want craftsmanship. You want to believe that it's special. You want you know. There's this whole. There's there's a human piece there, and you when you see that in <clears throat> in oper in operations and in business. That's what Paz is telling you. They're like, hey, if you just re rewrite the world to match this platform, everything will be good for you. And it's like, okay, but how, for how long are you going to stick there? No, absolutely. I think you know you have to find an intersection of like having that technology, fitting into the enterprise, and, and keeping that that creativity and that spirit in the middle. And I think yeah. that's that's so important. You got to have it. And if you don't, then you'll fail. Like, or uh, for a minute, you'll feel successful because you'll be floating to right. equilibrium. And then you won't win yeah. because like everybody forgets that these huge businesses compete with each other. They're trying to win. Yeah. And so the idea that they're just going to standardize on the same platform and then they won't innovate at all on technology ever again, yeah. like, come on, that's not true. Yeah. One of them will decide to innovate and they will therefore win, mm -hmm. which means all of them need to have the ability to innovate. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a bunch. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having it's a hornet's nest. There, there are a lot of issues, but the one that I think is um, one of the more easily fixable ones and one of the ones that I've kind of noticed is that there are a lot of companies that are taking their cues from some of the bigger players. So you look at how Google hires or you look at how Facebook hires, right? right? And uh, it almost becomes this cargo cult yeah. uh, where there are a ton of smaller companies that don't need to have process at that scale but just blindly copy what these companies are doing. And um, they'll blindly copy the criteria that these companies use to even figure out who they're gonna let in the door, as well as their interview process and um, a lot of other things that they don't necessarily need. So what ends up happening is uh, you have all these people that are really, really great engineers, but didn't end up going to MIT or Stanford or have worked at you know Google, Facebook, or a particularly prominent Y Combinator company. Um, but they're never even going to be able to get in the door. So you have this long tail of, of people that are just as good.